like this then. Yeah. So now we've got um, a couple of our Cambridge sort of researchers who are doing some really interesting work um, in relation to a new open. It's a new open access generally, isn't it? Yes, it's yeah. very new. We only launched last last May. Yeah. Yeah. So very exciting. So it's something that's new that Cambridge is doing, and um, really looking forward to. Well, apparently Doris is going to do most of the talking, but also Lisa Marie is here as well. <laughs> yes. We well, thank you uh, for the. Video. So I'm Dora Alexopoulou. I'm a researcher. I work on uh, basically I'm a linguist. I do linguistics and language learning. Okay. I need to find. Um, and I'm the editor of the Language Society and Policy, and I'll tell you in a minute what that is. And this is Lisa uh, Maria Mueller, who is uh, also a researcher at Cambridge with interest in language acquisition, and she is one of uh, the managing editors of Language Society and Policy. So language Society and Policy basically is um, an online open <coughs> access journal that aims to um, uh, publish research ba policy papers that are uh, based on research evidence. Um, the whole uh, idea is actually inspired by the uh, history and policy, so I don't know if you're aware of it. I'm going to say a little bit of the history and how I came to set this up with uh, colleagues. So around 2010, uh, with colleagues in the Department of Linguistics, I set up the Cambridge Bilingualism Network, which was uh, an engagement initiative of the university to go out to local schools and more widely to uh, promote the benefits of bilingualism. Uh, so that was the, something that was coming out of our immediate research. Uh, and over the years, and as we started engaging with more and more <laughs> people and networks, I started became becoming a little bit frustrated uh, about the ways in which some of our, uh, uh, our research was uh, communicating or the non-existing challenge for communication. So, um, you know, journalists would just uh, pick up the phone and phone someone pretty much in random ways to ask about a topic and this someone would give information. And I think, you know, while there was a very, um, you know, there's a lot of work on, uh, a lot of information on language research out there in the media and very good uh, journalists doing fantastic job, I just felt that was actually something that we should take, uh, you know, uh, we should be in charge of and we should find a way that we actually collect uh, you know, research from around all universities, in fact, from around the world and find you know, a good way to communicate this uh, so that uh, you know, the journalists, the policy makers, yes, they can pick up phones and use their own connections, but there is also some place they know they can go to and start finding accessible information to them that is also has, that has some clear uh, uh, links to policy. And while I was having these frustrations, I went to a talk by uh, Simon Strater, who had set up the language in policy. So I don't know if you're aware of this. It's basically, uh, we are very much inspired by them. They are 15 years ahead. So we're trying to reproduce what uh, they've done for to <coughs> communicate results and insights from research in uh, uh, languages and linguistics. So I'll just give you, uh, so we <laughs> I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of what, uh, you know, this uh <coughs> journal looks like. It was launched uh, last May, so we only have our first collection and we're still, uh, you know, working on uh, launching another, a number of parts uh, of uh, the policy. Um, so, and it is also, yeah, I should say that in these first steps we are uh, completely supported uh, by uh, MAID, a big HRC project, uh, multilingualism, empowering individuals, transforming, uh, transforming society. societies, which is um <coughs> Uh, directed by Professor Wendy uh, Bennett and involves a big uh, collaboration of universities around UK. Now I find to, uh, I'll just need to go through. Okay, so basically LSP publishes high quality peer review language research in accessible and non-technical language to promote policy engagement and provide expertise to policy makers, journalists and stakeholders in education, health, business and elsewhere. So I'll just take you a little bit uh, <coughs> uh, uh, about, uh, sorry, the setup. If you look at the screen, you can 
Yes, maybe that is. <laughs> I need to put. No, I wanted to see the set. Uh, no, first perhaps the editorial team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would like to start from the editorial team. Um, obviously, it's me and Lisa Maria and Daniel, managing editors. But we have, perhaps, uh, we have set it up slightly different from LSP and obviously from the academic journal. So we have a set of associate editors who are all academics. And then in the editorial board, uh, we have um, people from outside academia, okay? So stakeholders who have an interest, potential interest, uh, in uh, the, uh, the research, you know, in the papers we want to publish. And the idea is here, in order to make this work accessible <laughs> to the outside world, it's better to have input, uh, you know, from people that uh, actually, you know, care about this, they can help us. And we've had a good response and that list actually uh, is going to um, enlarge. I'll, I'll come back actually to this, but I'll just go to the policy papers. Uh, I mean, there are two essential points of content and then there is the formatting. The, the, the big uh, precondition is that whatever research you want to <coughs> talk about, it has already, it, it needs to be published already. So we don't engage with the specialized peer reviewing. We take that for granted. So the research has to have been published. And then, uh, you know, the whole process is how you get, you write that in an accessible way and also make a link to policy. And the link to policy can range from uh, <coughs> an evaluation, you know, an, a, an implication your research may have on an existing policy, a potential evaluation of an existing policy in light of uh, a research result, uh, or, uh, you know, even suggestions for new policies, which not always academics <laughs> find easy to do. Uh, I'll go through the, the titles of our first collection just to give you an idea of the topics uh, and the feel. Uh, maybe I should go. Yeah. So we have the healthy linguistic diet, the value of linguistic diversity and language learning across lifespan. So this is a paper by a neuroscientist and an educator um, <coughs> discussing a number of um, basically tra a number of benefits <coughs> bilingualism brings to individuals and promoting this idea of introducing to schools uh, this idea of a healthy linguistic diet, the idea that in the same way every day you have uh, I don't know five portions of vegetables and fruit. You can encourage kids, especially kids uh, from different communities, but also monolingual English speakers to engage in a bit of language learning. And there's a lot of uh, basic research on the benefits of bilingualism for delaying uh, dementia and uh, the cognitive effects. Uh, can you? <laughs> um, this one, I think, is learning foreign languages in primary schools is younger the better by Florence Malch, a professor at Essex. It's, I think, a typical example of a paper uh, where research can inform policy and make it, if you wish, more realistic and more effective. It picks up on the idea that is widespread and actually has informed policy. The younger you start learning a language, the better it is. And you know the paper basically tries to uh, paint a more complex view on the basis of research and argue that yes, <laughs> there's a lot of evidence promoting this, but you need to put a lot of resources right at the beginning and basically a lot of hours of teaching, which is currently not the case in schools. I'll just go a little bit, uh, well, multicultural land on English and social and educational policies. This is about uh, specific, uh, you know, uh, stigmatized di dialects uh, in London and a lot of suggestions of how uh, discussing about these languages uh, in the, and bringing them in the curriculum can help in effect cohesion, uh, in uh, social cohesion in London, a number of, uh, and can be beneficial also to the individuals. Uh, multilingual education for multilingual speakers. Uh, this by Anth Maria Tindl is actually the chair of English and Applied Linguistics here in Cambridge in our department. And she really picks up uh, some recent studies on the uh, <coughs> uh, 
achievement of children with ad English as an additional language, and she's trying to explain, well, to you know, clarify and explain why learning English may be difficult or challenging for those kids, but there is a complex picture behind their achievements. Uh, and then we have some policy reviews on um, language policy in the Wales and also language policy in Europe. And perhaps the final one, can global cities have a language policy again from Manchester? So I, I think that gives you the flavor. So um, the papers are short. They have to be two to 3,000 words. Uh, you know, they the format, actually that was one of the hardest <laughs> parts of the first uh, <laughs> of the first round trying to get academics to, wrote, to write in a non-academic way for someone. Uh, so you know, avoid references, uh, avoid um, um, cite, you know, excessive citations, avoid jargon, be uh, simple and also uh, sharpen the policy implications, which is not something we think about uh, a lot all the time. Um, and now we are about, so on, so the, uh, let, shall we go to the kinds of papers? Yeah. Um, yes, but there's nothing really there yet. <laughs> but we, <laughs> we are about, oh. in the next two weeks, we are launching, uh, we're launching the dialogues papers with the title, uh, you know, uh, language policy in UK and we have a collection of papers from politicians and that is actually um, from politicians, stakeholders and academics uh, commenting on actually the non-existence <laughs> of language policy in UK uh, uh, with a number of suggestions. So that is like a forum where we see uh, more about dialogue on policy. Um, so I think, uh, you know, this is really, I, I don't think one can needs to explain why when you set up something like this has to be open access. I mean, trying to engage with uh, politicians and convince them to, in policy makers and, you know, convince them that they need to pay attention to evidence rather than, you know, their own ideas about things who should be, um, it's not going to happen if they have, if these papers are hidden behind the paywall. I mean, that is obvious. Um, and I guess, I think it is an important way and a good way to make your research relevant in the wider society. I think it's also a personal call, you know, you need, uh, you know, to want to do it. Right. Okay, and yeah, Lisa Maria now is going to tell you a little bit about why she uh, got involved with this project. Exactly. Um, so I'm a postdoc on Strand 5 of the Multilingualism Empowering Individuals <coughs> Transforming Societies project. And our whole project is um, very much policy focused. So our aim is um, to really do research that will indeed... Um, Sorry, no, I'm not sure if that's needed. But that will indeed lead to some uh, changes in how languages are taught, how they're perceived in, um, in society, how different dialects are perceived to lead to social cohesion and so on. And the reason why I got interested in working um, as a managing editor for, um, for the LSP journal is quite simple. My background is in foreign language teaching. This is um, what I did before I, and while I was doing my PhD. And a lot of my colleagues, I obviously, I had the luxury of doing a PhD alongside, so I obviously still had access to all of the, the academic articles um, and that wasn't a problem. So I could always um, re rely on, on, on that university access. However, a lot of my colleagues who during their studies to become teachers were extremely motivated and very interested in academia and what academia has to say about language teaching and learning, suddenly, um, were cut off uh, this, this access to all of these articles. And on top of that, when they did have access, most of them ended with the sentence, we need more research. So basically it was this amazing paper with um, clear findings, but the conclusion was, we don't know anything, we need more, we need more research. And that's not very useful um, if that's fine, if you're an academic. Um, and clearly that's the case, we do ne need more research, but also if you're a teacher, if you're a practitioner, if you're a speech and language therapist, 
you want an article that will actually impact what you're doing on an everyday basis in your field. So on the one hand, we try to reach the politicians who will make um, decisions kind of top down. But on the other hand, we also want to reach the practitioners who will actually now be able to go and read an article on language policy, for example, in Europe and how that impacts um, their, um, their work or whether it makes sense to teach languages in primary school and if we have to do it, how we're supposed to do it. So we're also aiming at the um, bottom-up approach. And this is what really motivates me. And so far the feedback from many practitioners I've spoken to was very, very positive. Because also how we designed the papers is that not only are they short and easy to access and obviously based on um, very high high profile um, academic research but on top of that we've also summarized them with bullet points at the beginning so that you if you don't have time to even read the two to three thousand um, word article you can just get a good idea of what what the paper is about uh, so this is what it, what's really motivating about it some of the challenging that were that are involved in in working on this is that uh, you, I, as a postdoc, uh, am facing high-profile uh, academics who are extremely good at what they're doing, um, extremely good at academic writing, and then I have to sit down and butcher their article and <laughs> tell them to rewrite it all so that um, it is actually uh, interesting and appealing for our audience. But so far that has actually worked really well and has <coughs> been a very positive experience and, and a high, steep learning curve for um, for everyone involved in, in the project, um, for the other managing editor as well, who is uh, Daniel, and who is not based at this university. So um, in terms of that, it's, it's a, as I said, a steep learning curve, and I'm definitely learning from, from the different types of articles. It was really interesting at the beginning to sit down and see what, uh, what different types of, types of articles we would have and how we could best, have, why they would be of interest. So we're going to have the policy papers, as Dora said, and dialogues, but also opinion articles where we want to open up the, um, the stage to, uh, to academics to voice uh, their opinion in a more casual way on things that are going on. Obviously, we've got the, the possibility of being um, of a very quick turnover and therefore being very much up to date and um, replying to uh, pol recent policy changes, for example. And also uh, the research lab papers where we want, uh, where we would like academics to uh, to explain what what uh, their daily research life looks like and why it leads to the outcomes and to the results that can then be used in in schools. So I think, in, for example, in schools or SLT practices, it is not just about language learning. So um, yeah, I think that that's it really. I'd encourage anyone, if you get the possibility to work as a, um, as a managing editor, for example, for a journal, I think it is an, an excellent learning opportunity. Um, and it is particularly working on this journal, it is particularly motivating to be working on something where um, the impact can be, has the potential of being, um, being quite, quite big. So yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much five minutes for questions, I yeah, think, yeah, is that <laughs> Yeah. No, they have to be ba so they have to be based on specific peer-reviewed research. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Can you <laughs> elaborate a little bit more? Sorry, I'm thinking more in terms of uh, myself being a medievalist. Mm -hmm. um, would you consider a paper from a medievalist um, perspective that says that, um, that the actual core paper that's based on is this is how this makes sense in the medieval context, and then your policy? 
Yes, I think in principle that's, yeah, that would be, so it's all about uh, the links. And of course, if you do something more historical, it's about bringing the relevance of something from the past to today, which I think, especially when it comes to multilingualism, it's really, we would love a paper actually that would bring something like this, because what people think is that everybody has always been monolingual, and that's the natural state of people. And in fact, historically, it's not, I mean, it's very, multilingualism is very widespread around the world today. Uh, but historically, it's been widespread even, you know, in Britain and Europe that for the last few decades, people have this idea of national, you know, you have the national language, national and state equation. And yeah, so, but I think it is important that, you know, there is this backup of, you know, th there is a backup of, core research on ready public because we cannot engage with the review in that. Okay, it's then we would be another type of journal. We'd have to become too specialist. Does that have any quick question? Uh, I'm interested to know uh, are you tracking whether the material that's being I know it's still quite new, <laughs> um, but it's being published in the pol in, in the in the journal, like where it's hitting in terms of policy. Can you can you do is there a causal arrow? <laughs> not yet. Not yet, not yes. Yet. <laughs> so for the moment, because we are part of this project and we have also, we're working together with a lot of the policy fellows, so the, the project as this has a number of other policy dimensions and we're doing workshops, and so we are part of the process and we're working, um, you know, it's one activity among many others, but we haven't stopped and taken stock for the moment um, on this particular, also because it's very early days. My hand is also from talking to people um, from the policy uh, research initiative and also from the experience with LSP. Is I, th I think something like this is really to gather uh, the research that can potentially have an impact on policy and open up the debate and then get, you know, raise the awareness of the issue. So we just don't leave it to the, you know, um, to the newspapers, which, or you know, we just get the newspapers also to, to talk to us about how they present it. So it's more about, I think, raising awareness of the issues, promoting a number of certain messages, and also raising all the issues around policy rather than um, impacting the policies per se. I think possibly for that you need something, you know, you really need to go with very specific proposals to very specific mm -hmm. people and just. But having said all that, the, the dialogues, one of the, one of the questions we have in the dialogues we, uh, start, we belong to, which is with the uh, UK language policy, is about, is about this actual issue, how do you change policy? And that's why we have tried to get politicians involved. Um, hopefully I have answered. <laughs> <laughs>